training and then a work study on the budget status report. And if you would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, Director Gallinger is absent tonight and Director Moraldo, although she's not at the table right this minute, will be back in in just a second and join us for um, most of the meeting. All right, so we are at public comment. This is an opportunity for public comment on issues not scheduled for public comment on the meeting agenda. Items that are scheduled for public comment tonight include the monitoring report EL11 discipline. All other public comments should be given now. Clearly state your name and school attendance area. Limit your comments to two minutes. We will be using a timer to help you with that. The board neither endorses nor censors any opinions expressed in public input. Please keep comments civil and respectful. No comments or applause from the audience, but feel free to wave hands to show support of the speaker. So we'll start with those uh, that are have signed up here in the room. And then, Stephen, you can let me know if there's anybody who's raised their hand on Zoom. So the first one in the room is Larry White. So if you'll go to the microphone and make sure to state your name and attendance area. My name is Larry White, um, or Lauriston White, officially. I was a employee at Issaquah Middle School and a coach at Issaquah High School. Um, the reason why I'm here is uh, I was terminated because of my response to a student repeatedly calling me an effing N-word. And I'm trying to understand, and I'm, my, I'm incredibly upset because I don't know if I should be more upset about the student his ability to call me that or the school districts treating me like that during the course of this process. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. Um, next up is Leah's. Oh yeah. Wave hands if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, next up is Leah Swanson. Yeah, I'm Jim Swanson. I'm speaking. I'm sorry. Uh, say your name again. Jim Swanson. Jim Swanson. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, she signed me up. I wasn't here yet. Okay. Uh, my son feeds into Isla High School. I'm here to support Larry for the, it seems to me is a pretty wrongful way of terminating someone. And I don't understand why you guys would do that. He's coached my oldest son, who's in college now. He's coached my younger son. And you really have gotten a, a nice, great coach. And I just don't, we don't understand why. I'd like to see you guys readdress this and figure out how you're going to solve the problem where you're, yeah, you know, punish a, a good guy versus some kid who's a hoodlum. That's it. Thank you for speaking. Uh, next up is Mackenzie Wilmot Wade. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Wilmot Wade. I am a junior at Isqua High School and the vice president of the IHS Thespian Troop 8397. I am back again today to invite you to Isqua High School's production of the Laramie Project. In front of you, there should be a card, which I really hope you read um, and keep as a written reminder of everything I've said today. I would like to start by thanking you for your time at the last school board meeting. We really appreciate having a platform to voice our thoughts and our opinions. Second, the Laramie Project. We want you there. There are four opportunities to see the show, November 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th at 7 p.m. in the Longman Performing Arts Center at Isqua High School. The show is about the town of Laramie, Wyoming, after the brutal, after the brutal beating and murder of a gay University of Wyoming student, Matthew Shepard, on October 12, 1998. Yesterday marks the 24th anniversary of Matthew Shepard's death. The Hate Crime Prevention Act passed in 2009 was dedicated to Matthew Shepard, and while his death helped make change in this country, we can't forget how Matthew was a person who dealt with struggles just like us. That's why we're doing this show. Reading through this script was the first time I had ever heard of Matthew Shepard. These are the kinds of things our history class don't teach. 
This is the show. This show has helped me and many of our cast learn how to navigate hard conversations and potentially uncomfortable situations. And it has taught me invaluable skills in dramatic acting. Superintendent Tao Yik, I know part of your first 100 day plan is to engage with students. This is amazing opportunity too. We would love to have you and the entire board there as well as anyone else present today. Please come and see what we've created and why we fight so hard for our department. If you do come and please say hi, we would love to know that you're there and we would love to be your friends. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we do all have the invitation up here. I appreciate it. I'm going to just mention that the board is at a WASDA conference in Spokane, three out of the four nights this is showing. So we will all put our, I know. And, and, and I even feel this because years back when my own daughter was in the play that was at this exact time, it was very difficult because I only got to see it that Saturday night. So we all have your invitation and we'll see what we can do on the one night that we're all in town. Thank you. All right, Stephen, is there anybody on Zoom that would like to give input? So there's one person. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I cannot read that name. Cammie Chris. Thank you. Okay, Cammy, you can go ahead and um, are you unmuted? I think oh, so. There you are. You are unmuted. So go ahead and state your name in attendance area and go ahead and give input. Thank you. My name is Cami Cress. I live in the Sunset attendance area, and I also work at Sunset Elementary. I'm a third grade teacher, and I just wanted to um, share at public input a, a positive thing. Um, the one-to-one -one implementation of laptops in third through whichever grade is the upper end. Um, I teach third, but it has been a huge game changer in my classroom. I've heard other elementary colleagues um, express similar thoughts. It is amazing to be able to have all of our students working on projects and not have to coordinate sharing a laptop cart with different, um, different teachers throughout the school. My class recently did finished our social studies unit and was able to offer students multiple digital tools for sharing their project and they were thrilled to be able to use PowerPoint. Um, and everyone was able to get it done in a reasonable amount of time um, during math and reading, being able to have students getting uh, lessons on different online programs while I'm working with other small groups is also really helpful. So just wanted to share a, a positive uh, impact from the way that some of the levy money was used. Great. Thank you very much for your input. Appreciate hearing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unless there's anyone else. <laughs> and there were hands waving in the back of the room. I like that. I, even you guys can wave. <laughs> um, all right. That concludes our public comment. And now we are on to approval of the consent agenda. I move the, I move the consent agenda be approved as presented. Second. All the right. All those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. And that passes unanimously. There you go. That one is done. Are there any changes uh, to the regular agenda? All right, then we are good to go. All right, first up is a review of the work study. Uh, right before uh, this meeting, we had the opportunity to meet with much of the um, cabinet and staff over uh, the work that primarily uh, Martin Turney and Mariah Banasek did on the new formatting of the budget status report. We went through it section by section so we could understand it. There's a lot more narrative in it that talks about what the funds are that make it well, a lot more readable to us and to the community that might um, be taking a look at it. Um, I thought it was um, very nicely formatted. And I'm really looking forward to having that now um, when, when it does roll out to being our official version um, to be there. So any other comments um, from the board? Just that I particularly liked the reformatted capital projects report. It um, is 
It gives us information about where the project ended up as compared to the original project budget. And of course, there are a whole variety of reasons that those things change. They aren't all bad. Sometimes we increase the scope. Sometimes we find unexpected challenges. And sometimes things can go over budget. But it's um, it's a lot more in informative to what I'm looking for. Um, so I really, really like that. Um, we gave them a handful of suggestions, but overall, I think it's it's pretty close to what we want. So I'm really pleased. Good. Uh, Dr. Mullings. Yes. I, so as a, as a big fan of the guide to understanding the budget, I appreciate the way that it goes through in common language explaining what are the components of the budget of the district, which is quite complex. And so what I like quite a bit about this new version of the um, the budget report is that I feel like it combines some of that information, basic information about the different categories of the budget and what they're for, as well as more, um, more narrative of uh, what is um, actually happening in a particular budget category. So mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, it's a good update. Great. I was gonna say for me, it's a matter of we're, we're financially responsible for the district, right? This is the this is the biggest thing that we as school board members do. And so having it in a way that is concise, readable, understandable, allows us to be able to do our job um, in the manner in which the, the public is seeking us to do it in. And I, so I do appreciate the clarity that it provides, especially around some of the other uh, funds. Excellent. Yeah, I think it makes it uh, more readable for us and more readable for the general public that takes a look at it and um, it helps them understand uh, what information we are gleaming from it. Anything you'd like to add? I just want to say thank you to Mariah Benassa for uh, leading the charge and making these updates um, and having a clear vision for that, uh, supported by Martin Turney and um, also the communications team and Leisha Engels for making sure that. Uh, we also could um, bring some of our up-to-date uh, images that reflect our current um, student population and universe was very helpful. So thank you to the team. Great. All right. All right. Uh, now on to monitoring report EL11 discipline, and we'll start with a motion. I move the board accept the annual internal monitoring report for EL11 discipline as presented. Second. All right. So I know that there are quite a few changes in this. So we would love to have you take us through what you would um, like us to focus on and then we can open it up to questions from the board um, as we go through this. Great, I'm gonna, um, Steve, I'm just checking my audio because I keep moving my, <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna hit some highlights uh, versus to go um, chronologically through the content of the report itself. And I wanted to start with some context, which is that um, this is our, you know, the 2021 to 2022 school year is a year that we are monitoring. And that was the first full year reviewing um, discipline as a concept for in-person learning. And that's notable not only because of the COVID year interruption or COVID years of interruption, but also because the discipline laws changed in 29 for the, to take effect the 2019 to the 2020 school year to go from a um, more intervention and support approach instead of a consequence and disciplinary approach. So um, I really wanna say that this is almost like a new baseline for us to use moving forward and to start to compare our progress against. Um, last year was also a different year because we had to also ensure we were um, supporting the classroom culture through the level of looking at mitigation strategies to prevent the spread of COVID. So there were other aspects of how we were looking at um, student culture interaction and so forth that um, is just a cont contextual factor. So some highlights that I wanted to share about how we've approached the monitoring report for last year as presented tonight. Uh, first and foremost, we looked at it through the lens, not just um, of physical safety, but also psychological safety. That is, uh, for our work and what we see across what our students need, oftentimes a very important um, component to making sure our students feel like they belong and that they are affirmed in their identity 
and that they feel like they can be their best selves and engage in classrooms productively for learning. Um, our interpretation has changed to reflect a stronger prominence um, and importance emphasis or an emphasis on the importance of ensuring our students are um, just feeling like they can learn and that we remove barriers that prohibit that. In addition, you'll also see greater emphasis in our interpretation as well as in our monitoring evidence to address and promote inclusive schools, in particular with a focus on equity. And much of the feedback that we heard from the board also was around what kind of uh, education training, and one of the student representatives mentioned this specifically, how do we make sure that we are um, communicating and promoting um, you know, the, the expectations for our students um, as they engage in learning, as they interact with each other, and as become um, healthy citizens in our, in our society. There's another aspect of the um, that we address also in our monitoring report to address trauma specifically and also digital safety as well. So those are some additional changes. Um, I will just highlight that as the team was reviewing this monitoring report and reflecting on last year, uh, we did go into the data and we will commit to continuing to have regular data reviews because discipline data and how our students are experiencing our school is real time. And we can actually see patterns and trends more immediately. So we have a commitment to, um, on a more regular basis, talking about that in real time. And knowing that disproportionality is the biggest priority for us to focus on as it relates to the experience of different populations in our school system and how there might be more incidences occurring with certain populations, specifically by race and ethnicity. Um, and that overlays with other demographic uh, factors as well, but um, like program enrollment, such as special education, uh, English language learners, et cetera. But the focus for us will really be on how we address the disproportionality for our students of color. And I will share that um, the board had noted potentially adjusting and thinking about the concept of equitably versus consistently, consistently in the board value statement. And we talked quite a bit around that and really uh, found that it's important to think about the consistent application of our expectations and our training, but that we are looking at the lens, or looking at our data and the experience of our students through the lens of equity. Um, and I know that this will be something that will be a healthy um, part of our conversation as we continue to look at um, on an annual basis our different executive limitations and and um, governance governance policies. So that's really the update from me. Um, and our team is here and has put a lot of good time into really reflecting it and uh, reflecting changes based on the interpretation and also, uh, frankly, making it a more concise report, as well as listing um, an order of priority within each section where we've seen, you know, both um, the first and secondary uh, efforts that we were making, but also the areas where we we're taking um, an approach where most students are getting all of all of our students are getting that particular support or notification of what we expect. That's it. All right, well, thank you. I know a lot of work went into this because there was quite a bit of an update on the interpretation and the data that was in um, included in this. So I will open it up to the board for questions, comments, discussion. Director Molly. Uh, so highly appreciate the more concise format. So thank you for that. Reports readable and I understand it. I think the thing, one of the things you just mentioned is maybe it'd be helpful for me is um, I see the, the current law, but I'm not as familiar with how it differs from what it was before. So if there's like two minutes on that, then we could just talk about what is the what is the difference and what are maybe um, some of the focus areas, because I'm I'm actually out reading the um, WAC now, but it doesn't really say like how it's evolved between the two. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to invite um, Andrea Zier up to talk about that, okay. um, some of the changes, and highlight that. That would be very helpful. Uh, Executive Director of Secondary of uh, High Schools. Hi, Andrea Zier, Executive Director of High Schools. Um, there are quite a 
few changes. Some of them are small nuance. I'm just going to kind of go over like the big ones that I think had the, the biggest impact. Um, the first uh, biggest change was that prior to receiving any exclusionary discipline, so there are um, kind of a couple categories of discipline. There is uh, non-exclusionary discipline, which would be anything where a student isn't being like suspended or expelled and removed from a classroom setting. So uh, non-exclusionary discipline would include things like a lunch detention, a Saturday school, a conference with an administrator and a parent together to talk about how to better handle a situation next time. So anything that is not taking a student out of a class. Exclusionary discipline is short-term suspension, long-term suspension, or expulsion. Um, the biggest change in the discipline laws was that prior to issuing any exclusionary discipline, you first had to you first have to attempt to do other forms of discipline before jumping straight to exclusionary discipline. So the first offense of a behavior for the student needs to be treated in a way that's more coaching and restorative than it is punitive with uh, removing them from the academic setting. Um, that was the largest change that had the biggest impact. Um, I will say the law does call out specific things. So if the behavior is criminal in nature, um, that is the one exception where you would go to exclusionary discipline. So things like weapons, um, distributing drugs or alcohol, not use, but distributing, um, really any weapons, um, assault. Um, so th things, and they, the law specifically calls that out. So that would be, I think, the biggest change. Um, the other largest change in the law is that a parent, uh, the student needs to have an informal conference before discipline is issued, um, and the parent is allowed to be present for that informal conference or in informal hearing is actually the language in the law. So um, previously, if you had evidence, let's say video surveillance, it's pretty clear about something that happened. Um, or a uh, student is maybe in possession. I'm trying to think of easy examples. Um, and there's really not, you have quite a bit of evidence. You could make a determination pre-2019-20 that uh, something occurred if you had enough evidence and, and issue the discipline. Um, now with the new laws, the student gets an informal hearing where they have a chance to discuss what occurred, um, their side of the story, and they are allowed to be invited to have parents present during that informal hearing um, before any decision is made on what the level of discipline is. Um, the, they cleaned up a little bit around emergency expulsion language. Um, so, uh, emergency expulsions used to be, um, treated more like a placeholder, um, for administrators to buy themselves time to be able to complete an investigation. Um, if they thought that a student had, there was a evidence to believe that a student was going to receive discipline. Um, now, uh, emergency expulsion should not be used as a placeholder to conduct an investigation, but it should only be used in circumstances where there's an immediate concern of safety. Um, and so to remove the student while they create a plan for it to be safe for the student to return, whether that's a safety plan, whether that is an investigation to really make sure that they know um, what happened. Um, so that those are, I think, the significant three changes to the law. Yeah. Thank you. Other, did you want to add anything? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Director Weaver. Oh, uh, oops. It's on. Um, this is kind of more of a comment or wondering than anything that would necessarily need to be changed. But um, I notice in number three, where we talk about um, may not permit any unruly behaviors to disrupt learning. And it's very clear in the verbiage that we're talking about things that happen in school, at school, sponsored activities on the bus. And I know that we have also had instances um, where things happen outside the school on a student's own time, on their own social media, but it somehow finds its way back into school and creates a disruption. And I know from the legal conferences that Director Moore and I have attended that the Supreme Court is getting... Um, or the courts are getting weird and squirrely about whether or not things that happen out of school actually constitute a disruption of in-school learning. And I just, I really, I'm not sure anything needs to change here, but I kind of wanted to bring it up because I know it's, it's, it's an area of the law that's fuzzy. And I know it's very frustrating to parents um, in both directions. When something happens outside of school, it explodes on social media and 
should the kid be disciplined? Should they not be disciplined? And how does that work? So I just kind of wanted to bring that up because it isn't really addressed in there at all. Um, and I don't know if it needs to be, but. Uh, thank you for bringing that. That is, it is a, an area that I, I know that has uh, generated lots of discussion in lots of different spaces. Uh, one of the very specific changes that we made to the interpretation was to <clears throat> acknowledge that um, while this is in-class behaviors, there's things that happen in between parts of the transition of the school day, whether it's in person or also virtually, that do affect a uh, student's ability to show up into a classroom. So we very specifically named that in, in section three, um, citing, um, I'll just read the sentence. I'm defining unruly or disruptive behavior as activity that prevents a student from being able to fully participate in class, whether this is due to any known in-class behaviors or due to interpersonal interactions in person or virtually during the day. Because we know when there is a um, uh, issue uh, at lunch potentially between students where there might be some you know, physical kind of um, interaction where that's not, people don't leave that positively. They still have with them as they go to their class that immediate reaction to what might've just happened or what they might've witnessed. The same might be true with cell phones. So in some cases I see um, cell phones are put away right at the beginning of classes so they're not available during class, but there are times when things happen in the middle of the day where um, cell phone use can sometimes also generate um, a kind of, uh, oh my gosh, you know, this just happened and there's a reaction to that. So we were defining it kind of in the school day um, and we that's why we added some of the digital um, safety components to, um, our monitoring evidence to ensure that we are teaching our students how to navigate successfully use of technology, uh, social media, um, and, and what cyberbullying actually is, and that is part of the universe. So we're acknowledging that it exists, but trying to um, and show the supports that we put in place, as well as know that um, uh, that there is, yes, uh, outside of the school day, um, matters do happen that interfere with potential learning, and we have to sort of uncover that and acknowledge that exists, but uh, we will handle that as it comes up during the school day. And, and I noticed, and in, in while we're on number three, you know, it's interesting we say the superintendent may not permit any unruly behaviors to disrupt learning. But of course, we, aren't, we know there are disruptions to, there are behaviors that end up disrupting learning. So the key is your very last sentence of that interpretation, which is really um, that those uh, instances of unruly or disruptive behavior by any person to remain unaddressed, right? They, it may have, it's, it's inevitable. It will, it will happen, but it's how it's addressed. And then students uh, and, and classrooms worked with to, um, you know, prevent additional um, disruptions to the classroom, right? So to me, that was um, important to recognize. Um, yeah, and I thought um, in, in general, there was a lot more of a, a focus on this instead of just the discipline and the outcome of discipline, but a focus on a safe environment. And we get to a safe environment by um, consistently enforcing the rules and consequences. Um, and to me, that that came out um, nice and strongly. And I appreciated too that um, we've started adding the board value at the beginning of um, the monitoring report because that very first little paragraph that said the board believes and on is the board value and why we have EL 11 discipline. Yeah, just to tag on to what you're saying, I felt reading this whole general interpretation that it it was just somehow blending better with that board value mm -hmm. that it was addressing the, as you said, it's addressing the value rather than the discipline itself. Mm -hmm. It's how do we, how do we get our, um, our student environment to be the place we want it to be. So I liked it. Mm -hmm. And director Mulling. So I agree with all the kind of interpretation and formatting things. I think the challenge we still have, is that the data bears out disproportionality, right? Yeah. So, um, and so I think that's really the nature of what's in what's in the report. Um, I will always state that's what brought me to this work, <laughs> the disproportionality and discipline in our system and clearly why I stay. So I think for me, <clears throat> it really becomes the, so what are we actually gonna do about that part? Because we're at year over year of still showing that we have 
um, we are significantly <clears throat> oversuspending based on the population of a, of a given race. Like if you look at our Latino and Hispanic students who are 10% uh, of the population being <clears throat> suspended 24% of the time, our Black students who are 2% of the population being suspended 14% of the time. So, you know, we can reformat it, which I like, and we can talk about it, but I guess what I still need to understand is what are we doing about it? Thank you for bringing that up. That, uh, that is a top priority for me and for our executive directors who oversee schools. It is, I know, a top priority for our school principals and building leaders as well. Um, we, as I shared earlier, there's, um, we believe we should be meeting on a more regular basis to look at this data. Um, and we're going to be putting into place some of those mechanisms, including maybe different reporting systems um, from our student and um, SIS teams to help support those conversations. So we are uh, step one, um, doing more to uh, engage with the data and that will generate um, a more problem solving focus in the moment in real time. And I hope to be able to add some of those details and data points um, as needed if we want to go deeper with a work session at any moment in time to talk about disproportionality, but also in next year's monitoring report. So I just <clears throat> have to say this out loud. Um, we know the students of color in each one of these buildings. We don't need to look at the data to know when they consistently show up in the office and they're consistently disciplined. What, I, what I'm hoping for is something much more proactive, which is those assistant principal, whoever has a Dean of Student responsibility becomes on a weekly and monthly basis accountable for looking what comes across their desk and working with the people who work in their buildings to do something different. I do not wanna have this conversation in a year. I understand we will do it. I just don't want to be this frustrated when, when we get there. And so for me, what I'm hoping for is that we can outline something very specific and proactive. I've worked in corporate America a long time. People look at DNI data all the time. And I say, you don't need DNI data to look at your team and see what's the representation and to take some action against it. So what I am begging is that someone takes an individual accountability in each of these buildings to look at the students who are being disciplined and make different choices. Director um, Maraldo. So uh, thank you, Director Mullings, for, for speaking out on this. Um, I too came back to the numbers still aren't very different. They are different from when I first started because for three years, as I sat on this board and asked for this information, I didn't get it. And then our previous superintendent took over and knew first time I'm going to get this data. And at that point, our African-American students were 28% of the suspension. So I have seen some changes, but that's been over 10 years now. Um, so I agree that how long do we have to wait for it to be something where we we try a different approach. Because I think our in-school suspensions, um, some of the other interventions have been different approaches, but I'd really like to hear from students. I think most of our schools now have um, equity club um, where you know um, we've had as boards, we've had conversations with uh, specifically students of color where we've welcomed them to have conversations with us. What can we do as a board and as a school system to really get at some of the heart of this. Um, and, and is it, how, what is our relationship with the students, like you said, that keep showing up? Because um, I'm one, my biggest wondering is still number of students with suspensions. I think those are individual. So it's not how many, you know, it's not there's, there were 46 suspensions. It was there were 46 students. Some of them might have been suspended or disciplined multiple times. So we know who the, um, our reoccurring visitors are to the, to the Dean's office or the assistant principal's office. So what can we do relationally that will be different? Superintendent. So thank you for um, continuing to 
ask about what we're doing proactively. I'm happy to share a few high level, and I would also want to invite team members up to share as well. Um, I, for the purpose of the monitoring report, I was th looking at through the lens of the data, right, and as well as the reporting and the cycle that which we're doing that, but also previewing that we're, our team is committed to getting at this. Like the the board asked me to highlight the number one priority, and and we did that in this monitoring report because we feel that we feel just as urgent as you do. Um, in my mind, we do. We know that we can we can we can put the names against these students now can't do that publicly. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I know, but I, I say that just for the public to be reminded of that. Um, and we also know that there are students that are in, involved with more incidences. Um, as, as you pointed out, uh, Director Moral, there are students that are involved with many more um, cases or incidences that we, we know we need to address. We do have um, support systems and tier one systems in place. We have teams that meet that look across um, the various issues that come out throughout the day. Uh, MTSS teams look at our students who are in need of the most critical interventions. Uh, we are you know, employing a new threat assessment protocol. We also are uh, really deeply thinking about how do we can, how do we partner with other organizations to specifically um, address air, hotspot areas where there might be a lot of activity. And um, I would invite, I mean, there've been some um, aspects of, you know, some of the work underway. Um, I'm going to ask Sherry and, and maybe Andrea to come up and share uh, a bit about how they've been partnering together. Um, I'll ask Sherry to kick off in particular because um, as the executive director of middle school who is new to our system, she also brings different ideas as well from prior work working in um, Seattle Public School. So you can share some of those details of how you've been working with some of the building leaders to really support our students. Sure. I'm Sherry Cox, Executive Director of Middle Schools, and I'm going to give a really concrete example before I kind of lead in, and it kind of comes from our work together as we're looking specifically at um, uh, IMS and IHS and how those two um, systems interact together and maybe not always in the way that best supports, at least from my perspective, the middle school students. And so one of the things that happens every single day to set our students up for what I consider probably a less than successful start to their school day from middle school perspective is that they get to school and they sit on a bus for 20 minutes. Imagine sitting on a bus for 20 minutes when you are an 11 to 13 year old and what's happening inside your body. And then they move from the bus into a, a crowded cafeteria where they wait another 10, 15 minutes for the bell to ring to be able to move out to their um, to their classes. They do this at the beginning of the day and they do this again at the end of the day. And to me, that's an adult systems error. We're not setting our students up at Issaquah Middle School to be successful in that environment. And so one of the things that I've done with in partnership with Andrea and in partnership with Martin and Jason and some others in the room is, well, what would it cost us to run buses that don't have middle school kids and high school kids at that specific site. Equity is about doing what's needed at a specific site. We're not having these problems at Maywood and Liberty. We're not having these problems um, up at Skyline in those schools. And so looking just at the school, we're trying to calculate the dollars, the additional staffing, et cetera, that it would require to separate the two bus systems. Or maybe they can ride together in the morning and we would move which I believe would require your support, we would move the start time of Issaquah Middle School to be the same as Issaquah High School. So we're really looking kind of systemically at what kinds of things that are currently in place that are not supporting our students to start their day or end their day successfully. And so that's just a small example of we're not doing it differently right now, but we're considering it and there will be a cost to it. And so we just have to weigh those things. I don't know, Andrew, if you have anything to add. Andrea is your executive director of high school. Um, I think I would just add a lot of this stuff is going to be more for this summer and heading into the school year than it was as much for last year. But um, along that same, I'll just carry on with the IMS IHS feeder pattern. We've noticed that within the data, as well as just like feeling the day-to-day -day experience that a lot of the discipline is focused and centered around peer conflict. And some of that peer conflict is actually happening in our neighborhoods, but then spilling over into the schools um, or at the community center after school and the garage area where a lot of students are hanging out. 
Um, and so we have been creating an intentional partnership to talk a little bit more with the garage, as well as some of the folks at the community center, um, as well as uh, partnering with our own people in the district, student interventions, things like that, um, to bring in some supports um, for those families to talk about how can we help um, get them the resources they need in terms of not having peer conflict that just continues to spill into the school. Um, so we had a parent night that was um, our wonderful equity department helped facilitate with some of our uh, Latinx, parent, Latinx parents and families that are um, involved to try to avoid um, anything leading to school discipline this year. Um, and then there's another partnership with Rashad, who we've used in the past, who's wonderful with our families coming up soon. Um, we also proactively this school year had, uh, I appreciate Director Mulling saying like, we know who these students are. Um, we had proactive, what we would call tier two, tier three meetings with some of these families to try to create some proactive relationships um, with the building administrators to really just dig into the student like, hey, let's have this be a strength base. Like, what are you good at? What do you want to do? Um, like, what are your post high school goals? Um, how can we support you as a family? Like, so there's a student family and school partnership where we can be in more regular communication to make sure that you have what you need to feel a sense of belonging, to access your classes and things like that. So um, all of our administrators proactively met with all of their tier, what I would consider tier three students that have like repeat discipline offenses or significant attendance this summer um, to try to, to partner with their families. Um, and then the last thing I'll add just to try to be <laughs> brief is that um, start which um, Superintendent Talyuk alluded to is that uh, the partnership with the ed directors, we are going to be working with our student information system to pull our discipline monthly. And as ed directors look at it each month and then have those follow up conversations with the school administrators who are, you know, boots on the ground working with these families to look at um, did we first appropriately issue discipline in each of these scenarios? And then also, how are we going to get out ahead of this to reduce these numbers? So um, we're going to be doing this rather than annually. <laughs> Uh, monthly to hopefully respond quicker and um, and intervene when there's problems. So. Good, Tom. That's uh, interesting. A lot of that work was happening this summer because, and this is one of the challenges. We're looking at a year in the rears, so we are looking at data and monitoring a year ago. But we want to know now also what is being implemented going forward to impact, especially in this particular area, um, with the disproportionality that we see, uh, what is being done to make changes so that next year it doesn't look like this or doesn't look as much like this. So that, that's good to hear um, and to morph both of these together, the looking in the past and looking forward more Dr. Uh, director Maldrell. yeah and and i think to that point you know i um heather and i think met with each of us kind of talking about our 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 thoughts around discipline and things like that and one of the things i mentioned is that the root word discipline actually means instruction and teaching so having that right it, it's not punishment which we very much have associated with it uh, it's actually you can be a disciple in which somebody is teaching you so discipline is around teaching and instruction. So I, I appreciate hearing from staff that we're trying to go after this mindset of meeting with individual students and families and doing that teaching and instruction of, of how, we, how we can be helpful. Having a strength-based mindset during those conversations, I think, are, are going to be important. Um, and especially monitoring it monthly to be able to adjust are we really starting to see a key difference in building relationship and building community so that because those are because discipline is up the misbehavior is always an acting out and so what can we do to address the reason and the root cause of those acting out well and and being able to look at it um you know much more quickly to see if the interventions or the work that's being done isn't 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 working right? Especially for those specific students that were there that are being um, worked with to try to build this student family school relationship. Then you know it, it just allows the opportunity to more quickly ramp up what the interventions are, and in and still in that vein of trying to to be relationship building. Dr. Mullings. 
<clears throat> I love engagement and relationship building, but maybe the thing I'm most mm -hmm. wanting to learn more about and maybe speaks more to what I think is at the core here are the adult and system failures. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if we want to know, as we review kind of the flow of students, the flow of the day, the consistent locations of discipline issues, um, at what time of day, um, for me, those are the places that in addition to the relationship building have are the most fruitful to look at. And I, I, my personal belief system is we have, we have aired a lot on the, where we've made our first inroads. I don't mean to say it that way, but where we've made first inroads is on relationship, which is mm -hmm. a positive step. Um, I would, I would encourage more in the realm of the operational realities in the schools. What is happening in what place, with what people, at what time of day, and what are the specific interventions that can and should be done in order to deflect, defer, reduce behaviors from occurring at, at all. And I think the more we can be introspective as a system, that we have opportunity in those spaces, the, the better off we'll be. Okay. <clears throat> any other thoughts? And I will ask for public comment if there isn't any other jumping out right now. Okay, let me ask for public comment and then um, we can come back to any other discussion. Is there any public comment from the room or the Zoom? Michelle Whitehead from the Zoom. And so if you'll turn on your video and unmute, there we go. Thank you. There you go. I, thank you. Um, I have a question about what you were speaking about earlier about the discipline. Um, I want to know if the discipline data is separated by children who have special needs or if this is just by children of color um, because the children who have been disciplined and are in special needs programs and services, they are treated differently and their suspensions are treated differently. And I wonder if you can define that and categorize that over what a special needs child's suspension looks like in the context of the discipline EL11 that you're talking about. And I wanted to know if parents will have access to this data, if this would be public information we could request, and um, if it would be broken down by maybe ethnicity or special needs, special education. Um, those are Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Does anybody else have any public input? If you have public input, you can go up to the microphone and make sure to state your name and the area of the district. Uh, Larry White, I guess I'm, as I said, former employee of the district, but I was actually on the ground there at IMS and IHS, and I can tell you exactly what's going on there. And I can tell you about the problems with the students of color that were, you know, where we're seeing that disproportionate amount, a lot of relates to the fact they don't have people of color there in, the, in an authority role for them. I One of the things that I was trying to do is I met with the LGBTQ group, the uh, BSA, which was the Black Student Union group, trying to bring those groups together because I knew there was a lot of turmoil going at. I, I, had, a, I had an LGBTQ student pull a knife on a, on a Black student my first month working at the school. Um, we had issues with uh, locally, you talk about some of the issues on the relationship building. A lot of the kids were stealing from the Dollar Tree down at the corner near IMS. And so what I did is I, on my own time, I went down there to, and said, here is my business card. I'm the security officer at IMS. If you see any Issaquah Middle School kids in here and you're, you think that they're stealing, let them know that you know, that you know Officer White. And with that, I actually had a, a mother thank me for doing that. She said, it's the greatest thing you did was showing up at, at the Dollar Tree because that was a problem. There were, you know, our kids were causing some issues there. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, 
was in the process of building those relationships. And, you know, that's kind of, I guess that's it. Thank you very much for your comments. All right. Anyone else in the public? All right. Back to the board and superintendent. I just want to say thank you. This was helpful. Um, it is about the action that we're taking to address the biggest areas of opportunity and need in the system. And um, I'm very confident in our team in getting at that problem and uh, excited to, you know, not excited about the problem, but I'm excited yeah. to um, see our direction change and shift and eliminate the disproportionality that currently exists. All right. Anything else from the board? All right, then all those. Oh, I'm really sorry. quick. So um, in the future, can you bring the um, the suspension data to include uh, students on disability? And I think we used to do low income, but I don't know. If we yes, that. yes. And, and just rem reminding people that there's overlap also with race and ethnicity. So right. uh, we, we can certainly do that. Can you make that? I was just going to say that. Could you make that note so that'll help her uh, later when that goes to um, be made, the, the report generated for next year? Okay. okay. All right. Anything else? All right, then all those in favor of approval of the monitoring report EL11 discipline say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that unanimously passes and we are good to go. Thank you for all the work on that. I know that was a, um, a big effort this year for that one. All right, we are now on to works in progress. Let us know what's happening. All right, so I've uh, I sent the board quite a lengthy update um, I think that's what happens when you have three weeks in between board meetings instead of two. Um, so I'll be actually pretty brief right now, but it has been a busy um, past few weeks. In particular, this has been a sprint mode of engaging uh, with folks and uh, kind of helping me conclude the first 100 days um, coming up pretty soon. And um, I do want to highlight a great visit I, I did with um, Executive Director of Elementary School, Susan Mundell, to visit Issaquah Valley Elementary and then see the dual language program, which I believe, you know, is great work by Principal Vanessa Garcia and her team in leaning into this important model for uh, linguistically diverse families, uh, but also for affirming the identities and cultures for many of our students. So that was pretty powerful and I'm looking forward to continuing to visit there. Um, preparing for the October 20th community forum, which will be about hearing directly from participants on several key questions and small groups. And the design of that time is really meant to foster inclusion and participation from having Spanish, Mandarin, Spanish and Mandarin, not Spanish, Mandarin, Spanish and Mandarin interpreters, for example, already um, available, secured uh, to be interpreters, and as well to put a, uh, in place a protocol that allows that each participant's voice can be heard um, is an important aspect of that design uh, in, in our efforts to hear from more people. And there will also be a simultaneously thought, a simultaneously launched thought exchange to also gather input on the same exact question so we can compare responses and get good robust input. Uh, the questions include, um, you know, would you tell us about a time when you felt really great about your student's school experience? Another question is, what do you want your child's life to look like as an ISD alum? Um, or uh, really thinking about what, you know, what their life is like after their time in K-12 education. And then some questions around what, based on uh, each individual participant's experience, would they recommend the district start doing, uh, the district stop doing, and what the district could, should continue to do and consider that as well. So those are the questions. They're already publicized. So people can have enough think time um, to also, that's another strategy to um, maximize inclusion and um, give people preparation time to think about that as they engage. I, I understand that we have just under 30 people already registered. Um, from my PTSA conversation, leadership conversations, I know that the, the push for scheduling and sort of RSVPing might happen the Monday before, so I'm expecting that to tick up uh, early next week. Um, a couple of updates from the equity department. Um, the equity department put on a financial aid event on October 12th, and there were 55 people in attendance. The breakdown um, of that was 
There were 19 people in the English session, 13 people in the Spanish session, 12 people in the Mandarin session, and 15 people in the Korean session. And this um, session covered also how families are to, who are undocumented can access financial aid for college, which is a very important aspect of um, providing educational awareness opportunities to all of our families. And there'll be um, a follow-up workshop later on November 9th to help families with filling out the financial aid applications. Um, we had an all-administrators meeting this week focused on uh, our building leaders and their leadership in leading professional learning with their staff on the October non-student day. And as a reminder, there are going to be family conferences this fall in lieu of a report card at the elementary level. And families will receive report cards in March and June as in the past, and messages um, to reinforce this reminder will be going out very soon. Thank you for that update. Yep. Anything, any questions? All right. Thank you. Um, and now we are on to a discussion on middle school athletics. So we will let you and team um, lead us in this. All right. I'm going to welcome back up um, Executive Director okay. of Middle School, Sherry Cox. Uh, she'll be joined by Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Donna Hood, and Executive Director of um, Finance and Operations, Business op Operations, <laughs> Business Services, <laughs> Mariah Benatzik. Um, but uh, we'll defer to Sherry here as she kicks us off and shares a presentation with us. Great. Well, good evening again, directors. Uh, my name is Sherry Cox, executive directors, uh, or executive director, just one of me, um, of middle school education. Um, I'm cloning myself. Um, and I am... I'm here to try to Come on, Stephen, you're making me look bad. It was working earlier. There we go. Um, I'm here tonight um, to just uh, share with you and discuss the athletic opportunities that we currently have available for our middle school students, and then take a deeper look at some of the data as we've uh, presented it. And I know you've had an opportunity to take a look at it prior to tonight regarding um, gender, school, and sports that our students can participate in at the middle school level. Um, in preparing for this presentation, I did a little uh, dive into the Middle School Athletic Handbook, um, uh, which is available online. And it calls out that our philosophy is to uh, recognize the unique development needs of middle level students, build student success through active participation, increase skill building and positive sportsmanship and then it goes on to say that it's about the participation, skill building, and sportsmanship. Um, and I'm hoping that as we go through this, that I see some head nods that this is, in fact, what we still believe to be the purpose of our athletics program at the middle level. Um, and so be thinking about that today as we continue through the slides. Um, this first graph uh, shows the 22-23 fall only number of teams, which include volleyball, which is a, a girls only sport, cross country, which is a co-ed sport, and a softball, which is a co-ed team as well. I do want to note that you don't see any lines uh, representing boys teams because this fall there are no boys teams. Um, softball was originally intended as a boys sport. However, it is now open to both uh, male and females uh, in the absence of uh, baseball teams. Um, you're also gonna see a similar uh, trend that the number of boys teams in the whole school year of 2020-21 also is a smaller number on the graph. <clears throat> I also wanna um, call something out that is important, I believe to all of us, is that there is no, um, the data does not account for students that identify as non-binary. In fact, in the system that we use called final forms, it only allows for two gender options, boys or girls, which is problematic. Uh, final forms also pulls uh, data from Skyward. And we've made a conscious choice here at the ISD uh, to not have a non-binary box in our Skyward system. We have a blank option and we tell staff who enter data not to use the blank box because it skews our data for federal reporting systems. One of the federal systems does not recognize the blank and it will 
arbitrarily assign a gender to a student. So um, there's, uh, I see that as very problematic on many levels. One is that the state and federal reporting systems do that. And second is that we've made a choice not to mark our students as, or allow them the choice to be non-binary. So what's happening is that some person who's entering the data is assigning a gender to a student that may not align to how they identify themselves. And so I'm gonna come at the end and talk about solutions that we have to working on some of these problems that are only tangentially related to uh, middle school athletics. Um, this is the 22-23 fall data that shows the overall number of student athletes on the teams. Again, the volleyball team, the cross country team, and the softball team. Um, this data does represent unique students because it's just the current season that's happening. So every student who has signed up for this fall is represented one time on this data sheet as far as gender is concerned. However, they may be a student on an IEP and also a student who is in our ELL programming. So they may show up on those smaller numbers more than one time. <clears throat> um, we would hope to see that the students on IEPs and the students on 504s and the students receiving uh, EL services would be representative of the percentage of students at each of these middle schools. We're not there, um, but it is something that did by looking at the data, I became aware of this issue and we can work uh, together with the school programming uh, folks to uh, try to raise those numbers. Uh, this is the 21-22 data, uh, the number of teams at each school by gender. And just a reminder that there are four sports seasons at the middle level. <clears throat> in the fall, again, there's volleyball, which is girls only, cross country, which is a co-ed, and softball, which is a co-ed sport. Uh, winter one, we have girls basketball and wrestling, which is co-ed. And then winter two, we have basketball, boys only, and then soccer, which is girls only. And then in the spring, we have track. Um, note here that there are more girls teams than boys teams and co-ed teams. And this graph represents the number of athletes for the 21-22 school year. The final number of student athletes is 3,103, but a reminder that these are not unique students. So if I am a student who plays four sports, I'm gonna show up four times at my school in the girl category. Um, and we're gonna work, one of the things that I hope to be able to do is to pull this data in a different way by working with the folks at Final Forms to um, allow us to do so. Um, <clears throat> you'll also note that except for uh, Beaver Lake, the number of girls that participate in athletics outnumbers boys at each of our schools. And again, uh, as I had mentioned in the previous graph, we're not seeing the number of students represented equally for those students that are on IEPs, 504s, or receiving EL services. So that's an area of growth for us. This is the staffing that is used for uh, middle school staffing allotments. Um, and just to want to call out a couple of things is that our coaches are not represented staff in the Issaquah School District. They can be either classified or certificated staff and they turn in timesheets to be paid if they're classified. We typically pay a higher total stipend than the Lake Washington and Renton school districts, but not as much as Kent because the Kent coaches are represented. The other thing I wanna call out about our staffing that I think has been a misperception is that the staffing at the middle school for coaches, including intramural coaches, do not need to be middle school staff at that school. That it is open to anyone who passes all of the Issaquah School District background checks, et cetera. And then I think now we start to talk about some of the impacts that perhaps systems and structures have on the opportunity for our students to participate. This graph highlights the impact of available coaches on student opportunity to play volleyball. You'll note that students at Beaver Lake, Pacific, Cascade, and Pine Lake Middle Schools were cut from the volleyball team because there were no applicants to coach the intramurals. This graph also shows that the coaches at each building determine the number of students to, that they kept on the team. 
For example, Beaver Lake kept 26 students, Pacific Cascade kept 24 students, and Pine Lake kept 27 students after the cuts. This is a systems issue that we can fix now that we know it exists. Coaches are usually, the, as I already mentioned that, they're usually the staff at the school, but it's not a requirement. Um, the three schools that do have intramural coaches, though, those are staff at the school. Um, and while I only displayed volleyball, you would see similar data patterns for last year's basketball teams and soccer teams throughout the district. And now I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you, Sherry. Assistant Superintendent Donna Hood, Human Resources. Uh, in August, we do open final forms so that students can begin to register. So we actually transitioned to final forms when I was still the exec director of high schools. And we used this platform. Um, and at the, at the very beginning, we were a little nervous about opening all sports in August, not sure exactly how it would play out, where we're going to crash the system, what was going to happen with the predictability of student enrollment for those sports. And it's actually gone very well. Um, and we found it's a, a very lovely convenience for students and parents, especially those who know what their kids are going to do and just want to get it all done at one time in August. It's been much more user-friendly, very also phone-friendly for those who may not be sitting at a desktop computer, for example, and wanting to register instead over the phone. Uh, on the Friday before each season then begins, we close the window to enter the data then for that specific sports season. There's some cutoffs and some timelines, but again, all folks can start registering in August and could potentially register for every sport they want to do that year. Then the ADs at the high schools or the assistant principals at the middle schools monitor the number of students who are signing up so they can see real-time data and kind of predict where it's going to go. And this is where some of our more seasoned folks have a sense as they're watching the numbers, okay, this is what I think is going to happen. Um, as they get the student numbers, so for example, if there's a new team and they have students who would warrant another coach, we want them to physically show up so that we know they are not just registered electronically, but also intending to play. And then when they physically show up, we can begin to hire a coach. Sometimes what we have done is um, authorized a volunteer through our volunteer background check and had a person volunteering. And then when we know the team is now stable and the students are in fact physically showing up, um, then we can also hire them on as a coach and potentially pay them for the time they'd already invested in the team. So that is one solution we have used in the past to help us um, in that gap stop period without sacrificing any student safety, of course. So as I have called out throughout the presentation, I just want to really um, to call this out that what's limiting opportunity for our students in middle school right now is coaches, um, the availability of coaches. So with uh, Martin and Donna, we've talked about looking at the review, the hiring, the 10 day hiring rule, and we want to do better job uh, recruiting and outreach. If cuts do become necessary, I'd like to take a look at and require coaches to keep the same number of teams at each middle school. There's no reason why one middle school kept 27 and another one kept 24. And that's not a huge difference, but for those three students, it's a huge difference. The data that you saw today was pretty difficult to pull. Um, it took a lot of staff looking at one data source to pull it into another data source. And there can be human error in there, which I believe um, you saw on the first set of data that was sent to you. And so we want to continue to work and train staff on final forms to be sure that when we present data to anyone that it's accurate data. And then um, and then one of the other things is to gather the unique student data so that when you're looking at data, you're not going to see the same student showing up um, four different times. And then the last thing um, that I had mentioned was the misgendering of students on final forms and also even kind of more systemic level, the uh, allowing our students who identify as non-binary to select that as an option for their gender in Skyward as well. And so I just want to first offer myself to any questions that you might have. And then I'd love to know, like, are we aligned on purpose and philosophy of our middle school athletic programs? And if we're not, I'd like to hear your thoughts about it and what you think we should do differently um, as we move forward. 
All right. Thank you very much for the, taking us through uh, the information that had been sent. Is there anything you'd like to add before I turn it over to the board to ask questions or discuss? Um, I just want to say thank you to, to Sherry for um, bringing this forward in this way tonight for us to engage in a um, very important topic as it relates to access and opportunity for middle school athletics and and to Donna and her team, Carlina specifically, um, and Mariah um, and Tom and Martin for pulling together and looking at the information collectively as we were making sense of that. We do have additional budget and capital project information as needed, but because of our focus on um, the coaching need, right, and some of these other additional systems, things that we can we need to think about, we want to just sort of pause there and make sure we mm -hmm. got feedback on alignment of our um, philosophy and purpose for middle school athletics and then what this sparks for you about um, suggestions, ideas, or wonderings. All right, I'll toss it over to the board. Anybody want to start? Director Mullings. Yeah, it's uh, very helpful, very helpful conversation. Um, and I guess I just want to get some clarity. I understand the limitation of coaches and I have a couple questions about that, but when we look at other factors, uh, any facility differences, I guess physical plant sort of differences, equipment, are, do we assume that those are all equal and then coaching is the sole differentiator at the middle level of what we can offer in what school or is that given to us as like the main driver? Um, there are no differences. I mean, I'm going to lean over and look at Tom. Um, in our facilities, as far as our gym spaces go, in our athletic fields, um, and uh, at first we thought we were not going to have a softball field at Cougar Mountain, so we made arrangements with the local parks to. Um, but in fact, we do have a softball field now at Cougar Mountain. So, Tom, give me a thumbs up. To my understanding, all of our facilities are exactly the same for middle schools. And any. We didn't get into fees at all. So are all sports, is there, are there any fees for students or fully free at middle? There are fees. Okay. And are those equal across schools? Um, that's a, yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up thumbs from up. Jason yeah. Morris in the back. Thank you. Okay. I have a great team back there. Okay. Can I keep going to my coach? Question oh, then? yes, go ahead. Okay. Because that was just want to make sure that I wasn't. Yeah, Not thank you. I another. mean, if you if anyone else sees other possible root causes, please bring them to our attention because we may have blind spots to them, or we may have an answer that why we don't think that's a problem. Awesome. Um, and so on the on the coach question, and now I don't remember. Maybe it's this document I'm looking at right now. So it was specifically in some of these lists, like no, like wrestling coach, but no intramural coach. So what is what is practically the difference? Because our, don't our middle schools only play each other anyway? So I'm not sure why we separate intramural from not intramural at the middle level. Um, that's a great question. And Director Moore asked me a similar question the other okay. day on the phone. So um, I think we both, we, well, those of us who know sports, understand the high school a little bit better where we have the varsity team, the JV right. team, and the intramural team would be kind of considered the C team. Um, and so for schools that have huge participation and turnout, if they can hire an intramural coach for some sports, we allow that to happen. It's a shorter season um, and it's, there are no cuts to it. So it's a, it's a little bit, um, it's less competitive. Wonder, because that's what I'm trying to get to is the no cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. going to no cut next. So I should look at intramural as a no as a no mm -hmm. cut. Correct. Portion. The limitation, intramural. The limitation is the coaching. Is the coaching? No, I, okay. I, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, get that. yeah. And as a, you know, and there are other sports though who who don't have cuts like cross country, for example, track. They take a, a infinite number of middle school students to make those teams. So I guess at middle, what I would like to understand that maybe I'm not seeing here is it's a bit mixed in is what percentage of the offerings are skilled, skilled players who are selecting for skill versus no cut. <clears throat> and I will just replace intramural with no cut in my mind for now, which I prefer because it's all intramural, frankly. And um, 
I would like, I guess what I'd ultimately like to understand is if that is a limiting factor or if that is our concern around students who receive special services. Um, because to me today, that's not super clear of what is the total opportunity for no cut sports within the school. So the what drives the cut besides the coaching is the size of the team. So um, our cut sports are volleyball, basketball, and soccer are primarily the sports that have cuts because there are only so many students on a team at one time. And so it typically drives a cut because it's hard to supervise. If only five girls are playing at one time and you've got 25 girls on the bench, it, it becomes a, a bit of a supervision issue. And so the non-cut sports are the more individual sports. Um, so uh, cross country is non-cut. Uh, softball is, uh, is I, sorry, I forgot to mention softball is a cut and they do have, um, they keep making teams is what they do with softball. It's a little bit different. Um, wrestling is not cut and track is a non-cut sport. Can I add in a question while you're, you're still you're yeah. still mulling? And, and this has to a little bit to do with the intramural, and it has been a long mm -hmm. time since I've had kids in the, the middle school. So if we talk about kind of three levels of teams, um, the, the our middle school teams play our other middle schools, or at mm -hmm. least they they did at my time. They do. Do the do the intramural kids play against other <laughs> schools or do they is it primarily within their school? I was just trying to understand the, the difference. I'm going to look to my friend Jason Morris, but my understanding is that they do play the other schools in the district. Is that correct? Oh, he's coming up. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Jason Morris, Exec Director of Operations and former Exec Director of Middle Schools. Um, our intramural teams have traveled, okay. and and it, but they also play internally um, because sometimes schools don't have a team. And so if, for example, two schools in the league had um, enough, for, enough student interest for a team or the coaches for a team, um, that they would play each other twice and then that's it. So what, what we've done in the past is they play each other, but then we arrange for inner squad uh, games to try to get more opportunities for the students. Okay. So it kind of varies depending on the sport and how many teams we have. We try to get as many of those opportunities for the students as possible. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I, I can tell you that right now, the three teams, the three volleyball teams that do have intramural teams are not traveling. They've made a, jo a choice because only three of the six have them. They're just going to play inter school mm. team games. Okay. Against other teams at their school. Okay. Thank you. Keep going. <laughs> I guess there. I guess maybe if I just get back to the old, at some point we're cutting based on skill because of size ish, give or take. Mm -hmm. And then we are also then limiting which sports kids can play that they have a full, full opportunity to participate in, um, in an intramural case. And then we're again, limiting what their experience is because we don't have intramural teams at all schools. Mm -hmm. So I guess I am, and maybe if I get back to your Uber point, which is the coaching question, is, is it really, philosophic, your point about are we aligned on philosophy? And I guess my, what I'd like to align on philosophically is that our goal is to provide a full experience, which is to get to compete fully, regardless of skill level across sports in the district. And so I feel like based on all of those cuts of limitation that that's actually not where we end up. So how do we philosophically align to what is the opportunity to fully participate, right? If I never, if I never in middle school get to get on the bus and have the thrill of going to the other school and the thrill of competing against the kid in the other uniform, I will embrace sport differently. And I say that as a sports parent and as having uh, played sports. And so 
how do we practically create an environment that all of the kids get to have that experience in the school? And then we back up to, so then what is the, what are the offerings? Mm -hmm. But it seems we're going the opposite direction. I, I don't know if we're going in the opposite direction per I mean, se. I mean the opposite I, direction from progress. I mean, oh. we're staffing the other way. We're starting with filling the teams, which creates the opportunity that kids get to then execute on. There are some coaching positions that we know we will have at each school each year. It's when there's a new team that might be added or created that we're really closely watching those physical numbers. Um, so, so there are some that we, we just know are going to exist and we plan uh, both financially and, and otherwise to staff those. Um, one thing I should have mentioned earlier too, when we know that a new team is forming, um, we do post internally to all ISD staff, both certain classified, and that then triggers HR staff to also post externally. So we try to do them within hours of each other if we're all, you know, on it and not occupy with other tasks, but within 24 hours. Um, it's also posted externally to try to get volunteers interested and other applicants too. I, to I totally get that. I'm just calculating as the mom of two athletes, my kids get to put, can, can play every sport on the list, every time, every semester, every year, they get that full experience, right? How many other kids get to say get to say that because mine happen to have athletic abilities? That's I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. And so, is there a place or a way that we can say if that's an experience kids want to have, that we can create that environment, and that we may have to say yes, and that will only be in that will always be track and cross country, and that's the that's the answer. But I, I just at least from the way I heard the description, it sounds like that is not, that we started a slightly different place. I, I mean, there are opportunities for every student who wants to participate in some sports. That yeah. That is correct. There are other sports due to the size of the team that if we don't get an intramural coach, they will be cut. And the intramural coach, the intramural um, teams are a different experience than the other team. And so um, the one piece of data that I, I don't have in front of me that your question leads me to want to have is how many kids, and the other thing a little bit tricky about the data is that sometimes kids, in fact, I believe Donna Hood shared with me, her kid did that. They sign up in final forms saying that they want to play basketball, but they never go out for the team. And so the, some of the data might come down a little bit as far as those cuts go. I don't expect it would come down a great deal, but what I don't know is how many um, students uh, signed up in each of these cut sports and didn't make the team. So, and how many of them are unique students? So that maybe I'm not the greatest. I'm not the greatest volleyball player, but I'm a really good basketball player. So I didn't make the volleyball team, but I did have the experience that mm -hmm. you're explaining to play um, on the basketball team. And I didn't. Uh, that's a data point that I think is worthy of us trying to figure out. Dr. Weaver? Oh, Jason about oh, to say something. I don't know. Um, yeah, could I add just one uh, piece to that? Well, a practice that we have had with the different um, levels of coaching. Um, so, for example, wrestling starts out with two coaches, uh, a head coach and an assistant coach. Um, and when they get to 50 wrestlers, they add another coach because supervision, more kids, the like. That is true for track, cross, cross country, any of our sports that are non-cut. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that we do start the season off um, in the new season based on the number of students we had and number of coaches we had last year. So take, for example, if we had, you know, 80, 70 wrestlers, 80 wrestlers at a middle school and they had four coaches, we would expect to start that next season off with that number of coaches because we're kind of seeing a trend there that the wrestling turnout is 
you know, higher at, at a certain school versus another school. So we do try to, to use the, the previous counts to project forward how many cross country, how many track coaches we're going to need to accommodate the number that have signed up. Um, so it's not like we're, you know, seeing that number for brand new and having to go out and get coaches. We start off, um, some of our schools start off with six, seven, eight track coaches ready to go for that season. So just a point of clarity. I wanted to put back this slide uh, just so we could ground ourselves in the in the philosophy. Um, uh, I, not that we were steering away from it, but it's helpful to reflect back as we engage. We're, what we're looking for is additional, and this has been helpful because it's achieving, I think, one of the purposes, which is to get input. This is not a conversation we brought forward in this way, I believe, um, to the to the board in recent years, if ever. Uh, so, as we consider access and opportunity um, through that lens, you know, this is our first starting point of. Uh, what I expect to be multiple conversations throughout the year, potentially looking at um, different levels of participation in our athletic program and activities, uh, especially also for second uh, 912. Mm -hmm. So given that, I don't know if there's additional comments um, to sort of help provide input and in sort of as we go forward on this topic. And I, I appreciate Sherry bringing forward the highest um, impact opportunities and, and stating that this, that there are system things we can do. There are system things we can do, which actually mirrors our conversation on EL 11 to Director Mullins. Um, yeah, comments. I think the only other thing I want to call out quickly is that when I look at the numbers of a particular sport, and I'm not going to name it now, I wonder if it's the right sport for middle school because the numbers of participation are very low and it's one of the non-cut areas. And so thinking about, is there another sport during that season that we have this physical space for that would garner more interest from our middle school students. And I'll just leave it at that and take your comments. Mm -hmm. Dr. Weaver. Okay, I just have a couple of really basic questions here because I wanna be sure I understand the data that I'm looking at. So if I look at volleyball at Cougar Mountain, 97 girls turned out for volleyball and 97 girls are playing volleyball. And at Pacific Cascade, 110 girls turned out and 24 are playing. Now, is that because we just didn't have the coaches or is that because an assistant principal made a decision that- well, That's because they tried to hire an intramural coach and no one was interested. Okay. And then, then my second question would be at Cougar Mountain where we have 97 playing, are they all just playing randomly or is there like an A team, a B team, a C team? Yep. There's an oh, A, no, I, there's an sports A sports parent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, they're just like I had explained there. Think of it, A, B, C or varsity, junior varsity, and then a C team. Okay. So we are, we are segregating by the skill. majors, and the minors. And then presumably in the case the where we club. only had 24, somebody decided those were the 24 best players. Uh, that is an assumption that I would make as well. Okay. I mean, I didn't talk to the coach, but that's typically how, Right. As a former coach, that is how cuts happen is you typically pick your right. strongest athletes. And that was the only piece of the data that was really glaring is that the North End schools had one team and the Central South End schools had as many teams as they needed. And right. it was just right. Well, those North End teams had two teams for those 24 kids. Right. There were two teams. Two teams. Okay. So I, yeah. Okay, right. Fine. And so they had like the A and the B, but they yeah. what they didn't have is the intramural. And they did, yeah, they didn't have nearly as many teams as they had kids who indicated right. a desire to play. Right. right. Which I kind of get at high school, but it seems like at middle school, we're all about participation. So, yeah. Right. Okay. So I just wanted to be sure that I had clarity around that. I did have a kid who wrestled for like a season and a half, but other than that, we didn't really do sports at my house. So. Mm -hmm. Right. It's really about creating the opportunity for kids to be participants. Um, and, you know, taking a look at, you know, the timing and the outreach to find the coaches is an important element. Um, and, you know, some of this, especially when it's the intramural, I think when my kids played volleyball at the middle school, it was, they were on the intramural team because <laughs> we were all. But, that's okay. um, but that was okay because that's what they were looking for is simply the ability to build skill in it and to um, participate in the sportsmanship of being on a team. Um, to them, I don't think it was as important to go and play against other schools as just being able to participate in something with other kids. Yeah. And I do want to call out my Beaver Lake friends because um, 
uh, Andrew, the assistant principal, who's the athletic director, came up with a creative solution. They couldn't hire an intramural coach. His two, his head coach and his assistant coach are interested in doing the intramurals, but they can't do it at the same time. So he's offering, those coaches are offering to do the intramural season a slightly different time to, so that those girls can have an opportunity to participate. So there are creative oh, solutions. Creative solutions. Okay. I like that. Right. Thank Think you. outside that box. Anything else, Dr. Maldo? I just really wanted to say that twice this evening, you have talked about system and adult problems. And I have waited 13 years to have people come up here and say, my first priority is where are the system and adult problems? Because so many things have really been adult problems that end up hitting kids. So I just want to say thank you. You're welcome. And you will never hear me say anything except that this is a systems and a structure problem because none of our kids are broken and none of our adults are broken, but our systems need some work. So thank you. All right. Well, this is really great data, by the way. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, because I'm sure this wasn't right. easy to put together. So mm -hmm. I'll just but, throw that but out there. A good view into what's happening, which allows you all to uh, take a look at it and look for changes and then, you know, reevaluate and look at this again to see, uh, you know, if there's been any uh, positive, hopefully positive impact on uh, creating more opportunities for kids here. All right. All right. Thank you very much for that conversation. I think that was really helpful. Um, all right. We are moving on to legislative matters. I know Director Gallinger is not here today, so um, and he didn't give me any kind of a report other than I know that he did submit uh, to WASDA our uh, legislative priorities um, after legislative conference. So that did get submitted on our behalf by him. Director Maldo, do you have anything that you would add from your WASDA NSBA work? Um, not more than uh, Legislative Assembly was interesting. And so he and I tag teamed that work. Um, he last minute realized that the system that they used would not allow him to use his mobile phone to be the delegate because he was a delegate for something with the uh, doctors. So he's down in San Francisco. So I ended up being your delegate. Oh. I hope I voted the way I was supposed to. Um, Pretty much followed many of my colleagues in the King County area. Um, I did learn that there are school directors that don't understand the idea of a weighted vote. That was fun. Oh. Like, your three small districts calling for a weighted vote is not going to help you. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think one of the things that uh, because it's virtual and we didn't have a way of writing down the results, I could not, there was no way for me to go back. And if I missed the results of a vote, it was gone. So I've asked that was to provide us with information about how a vote went in the long run, um, because I think that is important data to really kind of know how far askew, how controversial is, are some of these issues that are coming forward. Um, and so I thought, I thought that was interesting. And most of it is anytime we use the word equity, I think is, is the one that is concerning for some groups. Um, and then Anything that has to do with uh, with additional funding, like funding models, I think is is concerning for small districts. What is that going to do to our tax base? Um, and we try to cons you know console them. And trust me, King County's paying for that. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, on okay. legislation, um, I just happened to glance at the notes from our last meeting mm -hmm. and realized that Director Gallinger scheduled several legislative meetings that are going to happen before our next meeting, but I don't actually um, have calendar invites or information about where they, are. I have times, but I don't know exactly where they're being held. And I'm pretty sure that he was working on a fact sheet or he something was. He was for us to speak off of. And I guess He's probably going to attend all those meetings. I don't want to go in by myself. Right. Because uh, I don't know what I'm doing exactly. Right. So I, I know um, from the last meeting, his plan was to do it with whoever was doing yeah. it with him. So there and, would be and two. And I'm happy to do that. But I just realized that those are coming yeah. up before the next meeting. And it would be nice to get the I's dotted and T's crossed. Um, well, I can shoot off an email to 
we are in motion of getting the fact sheet ready. Oh, good. Uh, there's exchange okay. between um, Director Gallander and um, Dr. Dana Bailey and, and Martin Turney. Okay. So that's in motion. Uh, the first one does not start until the 19th. So I think it's just a matter of probably figuring out the schedule and getting invites out. Okay. The, no, I just realized I was looking at that and then I realized they weren't on my calendar and Thank I don't want to accidentally not show up. Well, you're just going to have to write them on your own calendar. Thank you. Well, no, yeah. and I can do <laughs> that. Get a calendar I just, invite like I this. said, I don't, are they here? Are oh. they at a, another they're, location? I, they're, they're at a variety of different locations. So okay, that's the invite will be the location. <laughs> okay. We have the information based on the last discussion of where people could be flexible, where people have constraints on the okay. possible options. So we'll just need to match that up and resolve it. Yeah. Okay. So I guess that would be a good thing. Um, as I said, I figured that was all being handled, but I just needed to throw it out there to make sure I show up in the right place at okay. the right time. Uh, I can send an email to Director Gallinger and just ask that he reach out because I know I I did none of those dates worked for me, so I wasn't. Yeah, um, yeah I'm pretty sure I meetings. said yes to the 27th. Yes, the 27th. Yeah, and I said yes to the 19th with uh, Representative Sen and Representative Ty. Okay, good. All right. So we can kind of get an update on that and those dates in the fact sheet. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Next, does anybody have any announcements or correspondence to add? I did have one uh, from the Central Washington University. Unfortunately, I was not able to make the advisory meeting today. Um, but of course, I had it in front of me. And now, where is it? They are having two events. Um, at the CWU Sammamish uh, um, facility, a sustainability and action le lecture is on October 17th. Uh, and then they're on the um, November 7th, they're having a panel that's featuring representatives from PSE, local city government, and the CWU uh, faculty, again, around sustainability. So um, they have two events coming up and you can, I can forward the flyer if you want to get that out to the community or that you're in, if they're interested. I know we have a lot of members of our community that are interested in sustainability. Sure. Go ahead so. and pass it on. That'd be great. Anything else? I do have one. All right. I don't know why that reminded me, but it did. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'm forwarding to you right now, Diane. So I was invited uh, to, I think it's the first of its kind. So the Washington State Commission um, on African American Affairs invited me to um, a, a meet and greet for Black elected officials in the state of Washington. It's in December. So I did get invited to that. Good. All right. All right. If nothing else. Then on to calendar and future agenda topics. Um, I was just going to uh, remind everybody, we have the Holly Street Early Learning Center dedication October 26th from 2.30 to 4.30. And then that same day, uh, we have the WASDA Region 2 meeting, which I think is like in the High Line area. But anyway, C -tac. in SeaTac. Um, uh, that's from six to nine. So we can make some sort of a plan to maybe head on down there, um, together carpool. we can carpool down. And then we have the town hall on November 2nd at 7 PM at Maywood. And then I'm just going to throw out there that maybe it's time for us to schedule, um, a retreat day in the January, February time. So I'll, I'll take a look at that and see if I can work to, to throw out some dates and see if we can um, pencil something in uh, in that time window. But other than that, that's all I had on my list of things to remind everybody about. Anything else? I had one, remi one reminder on calendar, sure. which is um, Director uh, Weaver, Director Butlings, and Director Moore have let me know about the conference opportunity for ASU GSV Summit, which is in April. Um, Director Gallander had expressed interest, but wanted to know more about some of the timing pieces of the, of the programming and the, uh, the, the duration of that time. Uh, so we have a little bit of time to respond. So I want to make sure Director Moraldo has an opportunity to um, look at the opportunity and, and let us know about her indication interest. But it's a Quest School District. Um, specifically, we got 
uh, several scholarships to share. And so there are five scholarships specifically to, that I want to offer the board to defray the cost, not only of registration, but also of lodging. Um, and then I have, uh, we'll, we'll share some with our team and I have some other folks in my network that I, um, because of my prior attendance there and scholarship awards have uh, also been offering some opportunities for. So um, just would love to know that very soon and we'll go from there. It's a good opportunity. Great, thank you. All right, that is a good opportunity. It's a nice connection to have and it's very nice that it's um, a scholarship of both the registration and the lodging for the board. Thank you for uh, that. All right, then that's all I have. So with that, I, we, oh, I oh, did you. forget during the announcement piece, there was one other piece when you asked about NSBA. Oh. I don't know why I didn't oh, you mean say during this. legislation? Yeah, uh, oh, no, oh, for the oh, announcement. Oh, so um, last week, I think it was last week, it feels like a year ago, um, the uh, NSBA belongs to the Learning First Alliance. And we are leading a um, campaign that was initiated back on the 4th called Here for the Kids campaign. And so um, uh, the president of NSBA, Frank Henderson, was the first to speak at that to open up the campaign. And then I was uh, by video able to uh, provide just a little bit of uh, input and then forward on to a, um, they played a video from Pomona uh, Unified School District about engaging communities. But what was really important for me is that my portion was about the importance of parents and parent engagement and parent partnerships with schools. Mm. So if you want to see, if you go to the learningfirst.org uh, under their news section, it's hashtag here for the kids campaign that we launched. Okay. Thank you for doing that. It was a good opportunity for you and for, for them to hear from you. Great. All right. Anything else? All right, then we will adjourn tonight's meeting.